Well, thank you very much. And well, thank, thank you and the other organizers for you know, doing this wonderful job and, and really organizing an amazing conference. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of briefly describe um, like work that Jonas and I are currently doing. I mean, so there's, there's a kind of a, a paper, it will very, very soon be on the archive. Um, and it's called Collapse in the Closure of the Physical. Um, I think, uh, I mean, uh, well, because I don't have a lot of time, I won't start kind of uh, philosophizing too much about what this is all about. I'll just say that there is kind of, I think you'll see in this conference, there are several talks related to this, I mean, to the closure of the physical. I mean, to be honest, tomorrow we'll talk about this and, uh, and also talks about, uh, I mean, later today and also David Chalmers will talk about some, you know, collapse and uh, uh, I, I, I see this as kind of uh, our, our attempt at some form of triangulation. We're kind of trying to bring everyone to see that uh, kind of they, this is kind of forced on you, uh, <laughs> but, but you'll see during the talk what, what I'm talking about. So, um, I mean, the, the first thing I want to say is that kind of, um, well, I didn't tell you what the result is yet, but uh, the main thing I want to say is that it, it's not really about what consciousness is, but what consciousness does. And I think this is very important to always have in mind because there, there are lots of complaints somehow you might hear about uh, involving uh, you know, quantum mechanics or collapse or anything like that uh, when people talk about consciousness. Uh, and you see that kind of what we're proving is not, uh, is not kind of, we're not trying to tell you that you have to define consciousness in terms of collapse. Uh, you'll see that you can you know, define consciousness like in terms of IIT or in terms of kind of classical physics or in terms of, uh, let's say, classical biology. There, your definitions of you know, what consciousness is might not involve in any way uh, anything quantum. But the, if you don't, if your theory kind of is not a theory in which uh, physics is closed, and you know, if, if you don't, it doesn't satisfy the closure of the physical, then you'll see that kind of it it implies it kind of has you know you ask it yourself what does the change in physics and this is where collapse happens so so i think that's always really important to bear in mind uh, and that's kind of well the, the theorem and i'll kind of spend the next uh, 12 minutes or so to explain it so to leading order in time the induced physical evolution of any model of consciousness is a dynamical collapse model if and only if the model does not describe the physical is closed. Um, so I'll try to explain what this means. Um, so now a key ingredient in what I'm going to say is really that we're, we're trying, and this is something that you see kind of a lot in the work of Johannes and others, that it's a, it's a very, well, it's kind of a mathematical argument. So we use maths, but in a, in a formal way, in the sense that kind of we, the, the precise uh, ingredients of your theory of consciousness doesn't matter so much as, as long as it satisfies some very kind of um, uh, reasonable assumptions. And that's kind of the, the, the main thing we use. And the main uh, thing that we need is kind of the uh, really basic assumptions about what a like a scientific theory of consciousness will have one which is called a kind of epistemic asymmetry. And then the other one, other assumption is that uh, you know, scientific theory tells you how quantities change over time. That's kind of essentially the two things that will enter the, this formal modeling. Um, now, epistemic asymmetry as kind of you see here uh, is just essentially means that it's this basic fact about uh, looking at consciousness that you might say there's like the first person and third person perspective, um, right? So the, there are kind of like things that kind of come from natural sciences, you, you might say that, um, well, what's he written here is like objective and accessible from the outside perspective. So uh, that's part of what your kind of theory would tell you. So like uh, might be fMRI scans or EEG recordings, something like that. And then other things you would measure or would try to explain in the theory or model of consciousness 
or things that are first person, you know, how like the subject kind of can describe what they, they feel, if they see red, if they see blue, if they press the button. Um, so there are different kind of ways uh, of, of measuring this and different models and theories would look at different aspects, but, but there is this kind of asymmetry here between the third person and first person perspective uh, that kind of theories of consciousness uh, address. So, and the way kind of we look at this uh, formally is we say that uh, any model of consciousness has a set, you know, uh, E of states of consciousness. Again, this kind of set might be, you know, if, if someone says that, well, I see red or I see blue. I mean, that's uh, so some, some set of states of consciousness and then a state space of some physical theory that we call T uh, P. So that's kind of the, what your underlying physical theory tells you exists in the world. And then the, you have a set uh, D of trajectories that kind of tells you how P and E, how kind of your states of physics and your states of consciousness, how they co-vary, right? So that's, uh, that's in, in general, I think a very general assumption of what theories of consciousness uh, try to do. Um, now, um, now we can kind of look uh, at two things, right? Before we had uh, kind of this uh, set of dynamical trajectories D, but we can also look at the set of dynamical trajectories D P, which kind of your underlying physics tells you. And you can look at the restricted to P. So these are kind of the, the physical trajectories that are, that you're, a kind of model of consciousness uh, describes. So in other words, you look at all the trajectories that your model of consciousness uh, uh, give you when you just restrict them to the physical part. So using this, we can give a precise definition of what does it mean to, for the closure of the physical. So phys the phys physical is closed if and only if like the DP, which is what physics tells you happen, is exactly the same as D restricted to P, which is, so in other words, if you look at your theory of consciousness and you just look at the, you know, the time evolution of your uh, of physics, nothing changes. Um, now we assume that any, that in terms of state, at least, not in terms of theory reduction, I mean, that's kind of stronger, but in, at least in terms of state, everything can be reduced to quantum mechanics. I think that's a very reasonable assumption. You know, everything is made out of atoms. Uh, so all states are quantum states. I mean, you, I'm not saying it's easy to write it in this way or even necessary, but in principle it's possible. Uh, and then we have this kind of, the quantum frame is the one where you take your underlying state space to be the kind of unit vectors uh, of uh, Hilbert space, age. And, and kind of, you look at variations uh, like Psi T, E T, that's kind of how you write your theory. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, a base, you know, what immediately follows from this kind of uh, assumption that uh, you can write all physics uh, or states of any kind of physical theory in terms of quantum states is that in principle, you can write any model of consciousness, you can write it in a quantum frame. So that's kind of our basic assumption. In the short discussion later, we can discuss this. Uh, and now essentially what we want to do is kind of say, okay, so you have this extra you know, E variables or states E. What happens if you essentially, we assume now, I'm not going into the mathematical details, but let's assume that they form, you can put some measure on them, they form a measure space. And we kind of want to integrate them out. Right. What what do what can you tell about the theory if you kind of uh, average all of this experience? Uh, so the way to do this is we kind of in, introduce uh, essentially by assuming that E is a measure space, we introduce this kind of uh, stochastic process, which kind of tells you that you know if you start with a certain state of uh, of consciousness, kind of you can look at the the time evolution of of the quantum state involved from, from that. Um, and then you can kind of average over these possible things. 
uh, because there, there might be kind of different uh, trajectories starting with the same E. So that's what this notation does. It's averaging over this, these different trajectories. And then later you can also average over all of the, all of the possible E's, all of the possible experiences. So this is kind of, you have this uh, row T, which is the averaging out of experience and seeing kind of the effect of that on, on physics. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is a kind of a stochastic process in kind of density operators on your Hilbert space. Uh, and again, the basic lemma, which is quite clear from everything is that again, if, if physics is closed then really nothing happens, the row T just looks like what quantum theory uh, tells you it should look like. Um, now, there's another kind of assumption uh, that goes back to a paper by Gissen is that, uh, well, what does relativity tell you? So it turns out, well, if you assume special relativity or that you no signals can be exchanged over space like distances, um, you can look at these kind of uh, this stochastic process and also ask what happens if uh, you start it with a mixed state and you want it to kind of be independent of how you write down the mixed state. So this is the, this definition uh, of a, kind of when does such a family give you a well-defined time evolution. Um, and then there is this really nice argument essentially due to Gissin that this relativity theory implies that uh, the theory is a well-defined and linear time evolution of density operators. Um, now, the, the kind of really the difficult part mathematically of the paper is, is this following definition and proposition that until now we didn't assume that this stochastic process uh, is satisfies the Markov or property that is, has no memory. But uh, it turns out that you can always define a new stochastic process, um, this kind of Markov approximation that does satisfy the, the Markov property. Um, why do we need that? So, so now uh, so the point is that it, it satisfies the Markov property and it has the same average, right? So row T is the same for this kind of new Markov process as our original one. Now using, uh, now we have kind of lots of tools from that were developed over many years in mathematical physics. Uh, we can kind of get the following theorem. Uh, so to leading order in time, the stochastic evolution satisfies this kind of uh, master equation. So it, it must satisfy this um, for some Hamiltonian and some linear operators. So you see kind of it has a part which is the Schrodinger or the linear uh, evolution part. And then there is kind of this, uh, the formation of it uh, using these operators L. Uh, and again, another well, theorem uh, in the, uh, in mathematical physics allows us to actually see, here I'm giving you the general form of a, of a collapse model uh, in quantum mechanics. I think I'm almost running out of time. Uh, and, um, and we call a stochastic process a dynamical collapse model. Uh, again, if and only if you can actually, if you look at rho t, then this rho t would come from this, uh, this equation. Um, and, and the collapse term is non-zero, right? So of course, if, and if you look at, sorry, um, if you look at this equation, you see that again, the first part of it, this is a, I don't go into the details of this equation. It's a stochastic uh, a differential equation kind of in, in the Hilbert space. And you see that the first term is the Schrodinger equation, but then you have this nonlinear kind of uh, perturbation of it. Uh, and we want this nonlinear term to be non-zero. Um, so putting all of this together, that's kind of what the theorem says, that to leading order in time, the induced physical evolution of any model of consciousness is a dynamical collapse model if and only if the model does not describe the physical is closed. Um, yeah, uh, I, the thing to see here is kind of, we really, we, we're using very little assumptions. I think uh, my assumptions I think are very reasonable. Uh, the reason why we can prove such a, you might say a very strong result uh, about you know, such a strong limitation about 
theories of consciousness or models of consciousness uh, is because, you know, like decades of work in mathematical physics uh, that kind of we, we use and allow us to deduce you know, from very simple assumptions uh, this type of theorem. Uh, and I'll just kind of finish by, I think this is kind of the, the important question, the, and if it's the non-closure of the physical valid assumption. Um, so uh, yeah, so Johannes will, will talk about this uh, tomorrow. I, and I think I, I would say it, it probably is a valid assumption if we want to kind of have scientific theories of consciousness. We'll hear more about that. Uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.